Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, so we will wait for a minute or two to let people roll in and we'll begin in a short time. Thank you. All right, let's begin. Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be in your company right now, even though remotely. Topic of today is, is now the time to innovate. I'm Mithin Rathor. You have seen me here often. I'm the marketing director of the Flavors and Extract business from Tencent. Lynn? Hi, and I'm Lynn Dornplazer. I'm director of innovation and insight at Mintel. Uh, we have we have Lynn, who is uh, who is an expert in the field, and it's a pleasure to have in the company right now. Uh, Mintel and I have been talking about for a while around importance of new product development and things like that. So when we're thinking about a session, uh, uh, this was uh, this was a natural I want to think of. Uh, but uh, on that line, uh, we're going to kick off a new series, a new short series, and 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 perhaps the final series uh, as we all get back to some kind of normality coming to work on the uh, Just the next, uh, this next two or three sessions uh, in June, uh, and then we'll take a break till we, till we find a topic that is worth your time uh, in the next uh, uh, a month or two as we normalize. Uh, you've been with a, uh, with, in a company for almost the last two months, and uh, uh, my sincere thank you uh, for being here with us. You know, pleasure doing these sessions and it makes us think a little bit differently. It, it, it helps us open up and share certain things that we believe are important that, that you know and also learn from you because we've got some really good feedback. As you know, the session is recorded and you'll get a link to the session. There's a, uh, uh, there is a, the material that you need to send stuff uh, private to you. Uh, we will take a few questions. As always, we do focus and we make sure we dedicate some time to the questions. So you can put in your questions in the Q&A box um, as you feel. We will we'll cover and engage with those questions uh, as we wrap up the session. We're not expecting the session to be more than 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, and that's kind of my, 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 my cadence for the next session as well. Uh, as of, as of course, you will see it next Thursday and why coming to you uh, on, on Monday uh, for that. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's begin. So just a recap from uh, one of the sessions that I had just, uh, just two weeks ago, which was talking about uh, how do we prepare ourselves for, uh, for the post-COVID scenario. And uh, uh, there are a few things I'd shared over that time. I'm going to bring some of them back uh, uh, just as a kind of a recap. And the best way to see into or at least help guide us would be to understand the past a little better. And, um, and uh, I'll say all of us have been part of these three scenarios that, that we have or we have faced. Uh, we had the 9-11, uh, which actually caused uh, significant disruption. 
Uh, we saw the SARS 2003 outbreak, which also kind of led to some disruption. However, both these events were kind of a little bit more geographic in nature. Uh, SARS, which was kind of a little bit more Asia impacted, that's the way in the US, but it did impact, but not to the level uh, like we're seeing uh, right now. Uh, and of course, the uh, 9/11 was a low uh, was, a, was a local event, which really kind of uh, uh, sent waves across the nation uh, and across the world. Uh, but the one that is very very clear and and, and well aligned with uh, with something that we could look into is the financial crisis, uh, which basically uh, was a result of uh, several uh, uh, several elements coming through. And, but in this current situation, we have the virus on top of all of it. So, uh, so we have those elements going, uh, uh, going on right now, um, and we believe uh, the financial crisis is a good way to to help us guide uh, on what to expect in the future. Um, that's kind of is a takeaway in terms of how we are even planning the rest of the session today. And I did share with you the ten scenarios um, um, uh, to 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 digest. Uh, some more important to some versus the other. Uh, some that are absolutely executional and we can do something about it and there are somewhere i'll just watch out for you all to know that are you in the company of the right people to to help you out uh we we went we spoke about affordable intelligence these are two trends coming together affordable and indulgence and you know we spoke about the meanings behind both of them primarily around what's happening in people's home and how they're actually dealing with scenarios and how they're actually staying uh staying uh how to put it not just entertained but more more uh, uh more more alive in it uh, in it uh, in its normal sense um you move into uh inspired eating we all are experiencing that and a lot of that happening which has implication on our future purchase behavior and consumption behavior speed to market how fast we get things to market uh, um, and how we prepared for that our immunity is what we are seeing as a very big big piece of uh piece of uh, uh, consumer confidence going forward. Uh, as we are all in those taking care of our health, we are more in touch with our health, feel we are with our body. I think that that leads to certain type of products doing better in future. Uh, and retail brands, uh, we could speak about to length about it. So on this top top five that you see, you're going to bring small sessions uh, out to you and series I was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, we're going to open up affordable intelligence. We're going to open up inspired eating. We're going to open up uh, uh, and uh, open up retail brand um, uh, uh, and the power of that. And within that, we will intermingle some of the elements that you see spread around. That's the start session. I a start series of webinar. I was talking about. This is a good refresher. We know what we discuss. Um, if you want access to this webinar or the material, uh, please reach out to us or your account manager. We'll get that. Uh, so we, uh, uh, I'm not sure how familiar I, I, you are with the IRI pace setter. This is uh, annual release that happened during May, just got released, which talked about the power performers, good innovators, uh, products that did well uh, in 2019. Uh, and I will, I will really encourage you to go to IRI's website, and you will actually get, you can see the report there. Uh, but it actually lays out what what happened in 2019. And, and, and those who are not familiar with uh, with the IRI pace setter, it basically uh, captures or does a ranking or evaluation or analysis of uh, uh, innovation that won. Uh, and to be qualified as as somebody who did good, you have to have, uh, it has to be launched in the year 2019 in this case. Uh, it has to have minimum 30% distribution uh, and some other criteria. That leads to them analyzing it more deeply around what they saw. Uh, so here you actually see uh, a kind of trended approach to what what was happening throughout the year, and you'll see in the early part of the uh, uh, update you saw a uh, so, uh, 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 mid-sized brand uh, uh, mid-sized launches performing much better, or you could the opposite that were mid-sized but doing well, and then you start seeing. Uh, a rush to smaller sizes, uh, where people's expectations were getting readjusted, recalibrated about what innovation means, what new product means, and what is actually working and not working. We all know, we all have been part of scenarios where failure rate in innovation is very high, and this reflects about how we go up and down in terms of our expectation of what innovation means. And most recently, the 2019 one, you'll see that 
smaller launches under 20 million you know, uh, revenue from innovation to stabilize it, kind of seems it's getting some normality. You see mid-size launches coming back. Uh, and that tells me that a lot of folks have actually learned enough from all this history to how to innovate. Uh, but we also see something important. We also see big players really thinking hard about how they want to do innovation, what that actually means and what that looks like. You see that as well. A speed jump from 2% to 100 plus million dollar launches to, uh, to uh, uh, from 2% to 5%. Uh, to, to so that's, that's, there's a lot going on in this one. But this is just to start around how innovation itself has got calibrated, recalibrated, like year over year. And this is pre-COVID. I'm not sure whether I can predict how it's going to look next year or what even uh, uh, some of the criteria will be, but it's important to see what's happening in this field of how all of us on this call are are in tune with. So here is kind of like a very short recap of uh, some of the top ranks. Uh, you will see a lot of beverages, you will see a lot of clean beverages, a lot of healthy products. Uh, and it's kind of like products that did a fantastic job of executing you know, it or executing law. A white claw, we all are probably familiar with all that. And you see the number that it made. This 345 million that you see is actually only in C store. Uh, that's how big it is in C store. Uh, so there are, there's a mix of products. And the underlying theme around that is that you are bringing something more, more health conscious. You are able to scale up items that potentially didn't have the scale up credentials and now they are able to scale up and be available where you must expect us to see it. So you're seeing all these elements, and these are some of the representative products. This is a short list of them. But you also have uh, the others, the up and coming, which are also on the list. Uh, and over there, too, you see a familiar trend. You see uh, folks who are finally able to uh, get, a, get a scale up, uh, who, are, who are creating products within their own portfolio with a healthy mindset. Of course, you'll see a lot of indulgence here. So the theme remains kind of similar in terms of what works does not work when it comes to consumer. Yes, it's primarily, am I creating, am I launching something that is meaningful? Is there a need? Is there a vocation? More importantly, am I wowing them with a sensorial experience uh, that, uh, that creates more repeat uh, behavior? And you, can, you do not get into this if you don't have good repeat fundamentally. Right. So there are some cues here in the product folks on the call. I'll encourage you to go and uh, uh, go and check out the, the report. Here with it, uh, it's pretty recent. Right. Uh, so that's that's kind of to set up the expectation. And uh, uh, here I'll pass it on to Lynn. Great. Thanks. Well, I'm going to um, hop in that way back machine, and we're going to take a closer look just a little bit at. 2008, 2009, in the last the last recession, the Great Recession. Well, there's a lot that we can learn from it. One of my colleagues, I think, um, summed it up best. You see that quote from Lyndon Johnson. But at the at the bottom, you see one of my colleagues say, "Sometimes a look back is the best way to take a step forward." So let's do that. Let's take a look at the new product introduction numbers. And this comes from Mintel's Global New Products Database, looking just at the U.S. market. And it illustrates something really quite interesting. If you take a look at this, what you see is the data going back all the way to 2004 and then going up through the last recession and then up through 2019. And you see, if you take a look at the orange part of each bar, that is um, what we would call new product introductions. So those are products that are new brands, brand new concepts, something that's new, not a line extension, which is the blue that's at the bottom, not new packaging, which is the kind of purple there towards the top, and not a relaunch or formulation, which is at the very top of the bars. So what you saw then was um, at the very end of the last recession and for a couple years after, we saw increases in the number of new product introductions. It was later, it was after that, starting in 2013, that we began to see more varieties, more new packaging, what you would call renovation. That all came a little bit later. So for the U.S. market, and I'll show you some European uh, numbers a little bit later, for the U.S. market, new product introductions became more important right after the recession. 
So as we dig a little bit deeper to try to understand what was going on with some of the categories, this is a little bit complicated, but you can see the box around 2007, 2008, 2009 to get a sense of what was going on during the recession and immediately afterwards. And what we saw was we saw some product categories had a little bit of a bump in terms of new product introduction. So we saw increases in confectionery, in dairy products, in alcoholic drinks. Think about that a little bit. Keep in mind those, those three categories because in a few more slides, I'm going to talk about something that, that helps explain exactly what that was all about. So we saw some increases in some categories. This is just a, a selected group of categories to give you that sense. You can see in 2018 and 2019, we also have a box around that as well. Well, what's going to happen next? Do we think that some of these same categories will experience a bit of a bump as we move into a recession and then move out of that recession? I would say absolutely yes, that we will see some categories really being able to take advantage of these upcoming recessionary times. And that isn't just the categories that we've been talking about recently, like canned soup and some of those um, mainstay center of store um, products. I think we'll continue to see those grow, but I think we'll see other categories come online as well. But I wanna dig just a little bit deeper. So this is at a category level, but if we dig a little bit deeper, we can look at exactly the same data looking at what we would call subcategories. So looking at it a little more finely. And so looking back at the last recession, again, you see that it's um, seasonings, cookies, bread. Those were three that again, showed that little bit of a recession bump. And the question is then, what's gonna happen next? Is that what we're going to see this time? Well, I would guess that certainly with seasonings, we will continue to see that bump in this next recession. Bread, hard to tell. Um, I think perhaps consumers might get a little bit tired of baking sourdough bread at home, and so they might go back to buying it from the grocery store instead. Um, but I think for um, uh, the current times, this is where we would see um, canned soup showing some increases. But to to put the the 2008-2009 recession into um, a little bit more context. You know, Mitten talked about uh, the most recent uh, new product pay setters from IRI. Well, these are three from the 2010 new product pay setters from IRI. Chobani was at the very top, almost 150 million in its first year, so clearly a big hit. But you can see the other brands there too are ones that were. Um, very important then, and they're important today as well. Trop 50, that was the first orange juice that we saw in the market that had less sugar, but all the taste of orange juice. And there you see Green Mountain from uh, Curry, today from Curry Dr. Pepper, which was one of the very first in 2010, it was one of the very first K-cups for a Keurig machine. And again, you can see how well that did also. So we see major, major brands, again, lead, just as we see now in 2010, we saw major brands leading that, that IRI pace setters list. But there were other brands that were smaller that didn't make it onto the list that still were important and have important things to teach us for today. The one at the top there is um, from Mars. It's a Dove Merlot fudge sauce. Now, I'm very sad that that's not in the market anymore, but um, think about that with the indulgence and the um, treat factor of that. In the center, it's Starbucks Via, which is give you that coffee shop coffee on the go, wherever you'd like it, a very fancy way to have instant coffee. And as you can see by the data there, we saw at that time in 2010, more consumers, especially young consumers, making instant coffee at home. So it was the right product at the right time. The last one from a small company is a bar called Wine Time, which was the first one that we saw with resveratrol. That's an extract from wine, heart health benefits. So some fascinating products that really covered the gamut in terms of benefits to consumers. Now, if we back it up a little bit and take a look at Europe, now we see something different. We see a different pattern in Europe.
What we saw in Europe, um, uh, we did see innovation becoming more important. What we saw is a huge drive in private labor. So we saw things, we saw patterns being similar, but a little, but just a little bit different as well. Um, so I would say there is so much to learn, not only by looking at the U.S. market, but also looking further afield and looking at the patterns there that you see in other parts of the world. Now, back to the U.S. really briefly, um, it was fascinating to take a look at new product introductions by company over time. And the point to take away from this one is the lighter blue of each bar is the 100 companies that were the most active, that had the most number of new product introductions. And when you take a look at this data, what you see is that immediately after the recession, the big companies lost ground a bit, 2009, 2010, 2011, and then it began to shift. And companies that were not the most active ones became more active. We saw more introductions. So I would say keep an eye open to see what's going to happen. I think we'll see a greater impact when it comes to private label. We'll see a greater impact also when it comes to those challenger brands for the next several years. We also know that consumers really value products that are local. Now this data happens to be from Italy, but I think you can construe it to just about anywhere. This is um, data that goes back quite a long time, as you can see, asking consumers, or looking, sorry, looking at new product introductions and seeing the percentage of product introductions in Italy that had a made in Italy claim. And as you can see, we, we saw a big jump up in that um, after the recession. And I think we will see that again in many companies, countries around the world where consumers will be looking to have products that are local, that come from around the corner, nearby, whatever it might be. Now, remember I asked you to keep in mind confectionery and uh, dairy and alcoholic drinks. Well, that's what we call the lipstick effect. Um, that was uh, something that was coined, a phrase that was coined during the recession. But really what that's about is we see over and over again when there is financial hardship, consumers turn to small indulgences. So the thinking being, and, and I think many of us are thinking this right now, I can't take that big vacation. I'm not going to buy that, that brand new car. It isn't the right time to move and buy a bigger house, but I'm gonna have that gourmet ice cream. I'm gonna have that really beautiful artisan loaf of bread. I'm gonna have that fabulous, on, that fabulous frozen meal or chilled meal that's way more expensive than I would normally want. That's the lipstick effect. And that's most definitely something that we'll see continue in the next couple of years. So the last slide that, that I wanna talk about just really briefly is something else that we see, is we see consumers really becoming savvy shoppers, really becoming more um, discriminating, more choosier, finding the right way to balance um, benefit and price. And what you see here on this slide is for the UK market, and it shows and it shows um, sales of champagne, that's the darker line, and sparkling wine. Well, sparkling wine can give you the same uh, enjoyment, but is going to be less expensive than champagne, which is going to be uh, something that is imported from France as opposed to something that might be made locally. So this chart shows how consumers are more savvy than they ever have been before. But I think the, the bigger point to take away is consumers look for value with values. They want products that deliver on the values that are important to them at a price that makes sense to them. And for sure, that's something that we'll see moving forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mitten and let him talk some more. And I think uh, complimenting what, what Lynn was saying, if you can't bring things on time to the consumer, then you're probably not not really addressing uh, the gap. Uh, if you uh, if you overthink certain things, you are you are uh, uh, potentially taking uh, taking too long. Uh, so here we kind of like run into this this uh, this this unique dilemma about yeah the I call the NPD dilemma the innovation dilemma, which. 
I would say in all the people on this call are not strange to this thing. You know, there is always this, um, this, this balance that is needed between speed and rigor, speed and rigor, you know, how fast I'm going to the market or how certain I am or how confident I am regarding the launch. Now I use the word, word balance, but I would say it's actually a battle. There is one side that actually lands up winning in this situation. Um, and uh, 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 these criteria regarding regarding speed and uh, uh, speed and rigor uh, is paramount in almost every stage yet uh, uh, stage yet process. And I go here like you know joke apart. I we tend to see this within the context of a donkey and a horse, right? If you if you have a horse, you're going fast. You potentially know what you're doing. Hopefully, you know what you're doing, and you end up getting there fast enough, and you beat everyone else. Right, or you might actually think about no, I want to be absolutely certain. I want to take slow the donkey thing, where you're going to load up the donkey with all the things that you know. You want to be hundred percent certain. Of course, you'll be hundred percent certain, but it's quite likely you might be late. So this element of balancing those two, absolutely important, which which leads to you know uh, uh, my offer here is is how can an organization like Sentient uh, help you be balance that. How do you? How can uh, um, a supplier who has access to everything you need in terms of, uh, in terms of insights, product development, so on and so forth, and ingredients and flavors, you name it, technology, all of it, have access to all that? How do we bring all these things in the front? But I want to position this as somebody who helps you balance the the speed and the rhythm. You don't have to wait till your launch date to find out there are issues with the, uh, in the product. You don't have to uh, wonder too much about whether I am ideating around or am I creating products that are that are pragmatic. Can somebody make this thing? And here, an organization like Sinskin can play a, play a supporting role, help you either speed up and also in some cases uh, speed up and bring rigor at the same time because the engagement model that I, that I personally believe in has to bring the balance between speed and rigor. Uh, can I take you all the way up to a rapid product development? Can I help you create a concept? Can I help you even bring some insights and so on and so forth? How can we play that role, which is crucial? And the reason it's over here in this presentation, uh, if you cannot capture or cannot hold on to the consumers who are showing certain behavior right now, who are in your product profile, you're giving you an uh, enough opportunity to take advantage of where they are. You're not on time. If you don't do certain things, you might be late. I think that's kind of my offer as a sentient. And Mintel, we work closely so much. Just just in a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of have these kind of discussions around how we can actually uh, 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 balance this, this 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 rigor and speed uh, speed dilemma. Um, and uh, an organization like like Sentient can can be a, a, a supporting partner in your in your challenge. Uh, and here I have an example of, of what Lynn was uh, Lynn was talking about: uh, it's affordable indulgence. You know, uh, this isn't uh, this is uh, this is a concept that you can try and taste. It's an ice cream, an ice cream that brings back memories, some nostalgia, some seasonality. If this fall, for example, um, um, and uh, uh, and some adventure in there, regarding bringing something new that potentially they have not tried. This is an executable idea on spring. affordable indulgence because we have checked it out and what will take to bring this to life. These are the kind of things that I hope can leverage from fire. Um, and these are the things when I'm talking about. If this is here on the screen, I know that I can go to the lab and actually try this product. Uh, so that's kind of uh, my 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 key um, my, my my key point in this innovation. It's always been challenging. New product development always been challenging. How do you balance speed and rigor? How do you understand the past to inspire you to create something new? How do you how do you tap into the nostalgia and the things that are really taking uh, a high level importance in our lives? How can you deliver on that? And that's the beauty of uh, of uh, innovation. So with that, uh, I am I am on top of my time. My, almost precisely on thirty minutes. Uh, but uh, open up for some uh, some questions. Let's see what's going on there. Right. Uh, let's just start with uh, with one here. Um, 
in uh, and this probably could be for Lynn. Um, Lynn, do you, uh, the question is: Do you see difference in consumer behavior and uh, how they treat the things they do outside versus how they uh, how they treat themselves when they are inside the home? Oh, how they behave outside the home versus how they behave inside the home? Yeah. Yeah. Is there no. Some activity or no? Yeah, one of the, of course, one of the major challenges we have right now is that so few of us are outside the home much. Um, and what we're seeing, as we all know, and as we've read from so many different sources, is how many people are cooking more at home than they ever have before, um, even if they don't know how to cook, relying on uh, videos and other um, help wherever they can get it to help prepare meals for their families. And that's something I think that as we move out of this whole era of COVID, I think that's something that is going to stay with us a little bit. I think we're going to see consumers continue to do a certain amount of perhaps more cooking at home than they did in January uh, because they've gotten so used to doing it, because their families like it, because they're able to save a little money, perhaps. But then really having that eating out be an occasion and a treat, which doesn't mean expensive, but um, to have it be something that truly means something. Okay. Uh, the next one, I, will, I can take that one, and Lynn, you can jump in as well. Be, um, uh, uh, is, does category matter? Are these categories different? Uh, and I'll say it's a yes. Each category has its own resonance with the consumer. Uh, you can't you can't consider any of the past insights of what we believe is going to happen post COVID in a, in its in its one big a big block. You have to break it into how consumer consume. Uh, so um, your your frozen meal. The, the way people respond to that might not necessarily mean uh, uh, the same thing for let's say a beverage and so on so forth. Each, Segment has its own need and occasion. We have to see it between that uh, in, in that in that perspective. Lynn, want to yeah. add anything? I would I would totally agree that that uh, category does matter, uh, and certainly I think we've seen that in the last two months with the surge in sales of um, products in categories that everyone used to say were dying. You know all the center of store categories, which actually aren't dying at all. So yes, every category needs something just a little bit different. As you said, um, each category needs a different speed to get to market and to get to market effectively. Uh, and so learning uh, what works best for each category is absolutely essential. All right. I think uh, I think we have we have we have passed the time, and I think we have answered some of the critical ones. Others will take it uh, privately as well. But uh, I'll say thank you all for for being on the call. Um, uh, we enjoy your uh, your participation here as well. It's inspiring. Uh, please reach out to uh, uh, to us or even account managers if you uh, if you if you need any more uh, uh, support on this particular piece. Lynn, parting words. Um, I would just uh, echo what you said and to and to say um, any questions about Mintel and about what Mintel does, please do feel free to, to contact us. But I also really appreciate your taking time out of your busy day to listen to us talk for a little while today. Uh, with that, uh, thank you. Thank you all and have a fantastic day and weekend. Thank you. Thank you.